now that we've covered all the relativistic dynamics and kinematics we need to describe basic particle interactions, it's time to start looking at the history of particle physics. Now, the point of doing this is not to make you memorize lots of dates and names of dead physicists. It's simply to give you a familiarity with the different particles that were discovered and how they sort of fit in to the picture of the field, so that later on, when we start dealing with the physics behind these particles in greater detail, you've already got some familiarity with them and you're not trying to learn all the strange new particles and all of their physics at the same time. So the question now is, where did particle physics begin? Well, personally, I would tend to say that particle physics started with a British physicist named Dirac, who took two of the most fundamental physics theorems at the time, special relativity and quantum mechanics, and unified them together to form relativistic quantum mechanics that's the underpinning of the entire field of modern particle physics. However, we can sort of roll back even further than that into sort of particle physics prehistory, if you like, and go back to the discovery of the world's first fundamental particle, which was found way back in 1897 by the British physicist J.J. Thomson, who was studying things called cathode rays in the Cavendish Laboratory of Cambridge University. Now, the cathode rays that Thomson studied were produced when a metal was given a large negative charge and placed in a vacuum. And this caused it to emit these rays that shot off from the electrode and passed through the vacuum. And if you had a phosphorescent screen at the end of your vacuum tube, it would glow. And this is in fact exactly what happens in an old style TV. And this is why we've come down to my basement uh, where we have an old style cathode ray tube television. What this has is at the back, and these old star televisions are really thick, um, at the back here there is a cathode um, and the, this has a large negative potential applied to it which caused the rays to fly off it towards the screen here. Now, as Thomson discovered, the cathode rays could be deflected by both electric and magnetic fields. And in a television set like this, there are electric fields at the back that are used to scan the beam of cathode rays across the screen here, and a signal is applied to those plates as well to modulate it up and down a little bit. And in front of the screen here, there is a metal sheet, and cathode rays will not pass through a metal sheet, um, but the metal sheet here has holes in it in front of little dots of phosphor on the glass and different types of phosphor emit different colors and so by scanning the beam across and hitting the right dots in the right combinations you can produce all the colors that are needed to make up a television uh, picture. Now that is using electric fields but if I take a magnet here and I move this in front of the TV screen you can see that it generates a shadow right? It deflects the cathode rays and causes them to miss their holes and so it essentially generates a shadow in a way that moving my hand up and down in front of the screen does not. And what Thomson did in his now famous experiment is he started off with a beam of cathode rays and he first of all deflected them with a magnetic field and measured the radius of curvature of, that ma of the, the beam of the um, cathode rays. Then he applied an electric field such that the beam carried on without being disturbed. So in other words, he used the electric field to undo the bending caused by the magnetic field. And by measuring the electric field and the magnetic field and the radius of curvature in just the uh, magnetic field, he calculated that these cathode rays had a particular, were made up of particles and they had a charge to mass ratio because only charged particles were bent by both particle by both magnetic fields and electric fields and his experiment showed that no matter what material you used for the cathode you ended up with cathode ray particles that had the same um, charge to mass ratio. <laughs> 
Now, having done, having established that, he then went on to use these cathode rays to establish a new model for the atom that became known as the Christmas pudding or plum pudding model for the atom. Now, a Christmas pudding is something that is eaten in Britain, no guesses for knowing that it was e is eaten at Christmas, um, and basically it's an incredibly unhealthy but beautifully tasting pudding. We have one every Christmas in our household um, that consists of um, a lot of dried fruit, so currants, raisins, sultanas, um, there's breadcrumbs, milk, uh, large quantities of brandy, um, you know, candied peel. It's absolutely delicious and, and enormous, unfortunately, quantities of suet, a type of fat. It's an incredibly delicious, extremely unhealthy pudding that really should only be eaten once a year at Christmas. So, Thomson's model was using this sort of Christmas pudding, which since it's sort of generally spherical in shape, um, the currents in the Christmas pudding were his negative cathode rays. He wanted to call them corpuscles. Fortunately, that name proved to be enormously unpopular, and people instead went for the name electron. So his electrons were little currents embedded in this spherical substrate that made up the pudding, and the substrate itself had an overall positive charge. And so that was the birth of Thomson's Christmas pudding model of the atom. Now the other thing that was quite amazing about Thomson was, in fact, his he was an amazing teacher. He had eight research associates who all went on to win uh, Nobel Prizes. One of them not in physics, but the rest in physics. And in fact, his son also went on to win a Nobel Prize, somewhat ironically for actually proving that his father wasn't quite correct in treating these electrons as particles, because his son showed that these electrons could behave as waves. However, the next part of our story comes from one of Thomson's research associates, a person who I'm sure you've heard of before, Ernest Rutherford. Now, while Rutherford was working with Thomson, he studied X-rays. However, during that time he became fascinated with radioactivity. And so, in 1903, he was working at McGill University here in Canada, in Quebec, where he discovered that radioactivity caused atoms of one element to convert into atoms of a different element. Now, this was a radical idea at the time. Chemists had got Mendeleev's periodic table of the elements, and they regarded the elements in that table as sort of inviolable, right? In other words, if you had uh, atoms of oxygen, they would always be atoms of oxygen. You could move them around, bind them into different chemical compounds, but the oxygen would always be there. What Rutherford showed is that that's not always the case. One element can decay into another element. In fact, what he basically shown was that the ancient medieval alchemist's dream of turning lead into gold was at least theoretically possible. Turns out it's incredibly hard to do, but it is actually possible. So for that monumental discovery, Rutherford actually won the Nobel Prize in 1908. Unfortunately for Rutherford, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry and was so incensed at this being a physicist that he almost refused the prize. However, fortunately, his colleagues uh, convinced him that, you know, when you're offered a Nobel Prize, uh, you just say, yes, thank you very much, because nobody will care what the prize is really in. And that certainly seems to be the case, because very few people today seem to realize that Rutherford actually got his Nobel Prize, not only for not for the most important discovery that he made, but also not in physics. He got it in chemistry. Now, Rutherford then uh, returned back to the UK, and when he was there, he became very interested in proving Thomson's model of the atom to be correct. So this was the Christmas pudding model that Thomson had come up with after discovering the electron. And in 1908, he made the fateful decision to set an undergraduate student, Ernest Marsden, to work on studying alpha particle scattering from a gold foil. Now, this was a classic summer student undergraduate project. 
His group had already started alpha particle scattering through thin, thin sheets of a mineral called mica that consists mainly of silicon and oxygen, which are light elements. And so, having already done that experiment, you know, he sets his undergraduate student to do a similar experiment. It's one that hadn't been done before, so it was still interesting and exciting research, but of course it was very similar to something that had been done before, so there was lots of help that you could provide the undergraduate student. However, the results of that experiment were nothing short of absolutely astounding. So astounding that it took Rutherford and his group three years to confirm the results that Marsden got and to understand those results. So it wasn't until 1911 that he published the results as the discovery of the nucleus. And what Marsden saw was that some of the alpha particles, instead of just being slightly scattered as they passed through the foil, some of them bounced off the foil and headed back towards the source. And Rutherford at the time said that he would not have been more surprised if he had fired a cannonball at a sheet of tissue paper and it had bounced off and hit him. So in this case, what it meant, the only way to explain these results, was that instead of the Christmas pudding model of the atom, almost all the mass of the atom was concentrated in a tiny nucleus right at the center, and the heavy, fast-moving alpha particles would occasionally bounce off that heavy nucleus and head back out the way they came. And that was, of course, what's now called Rutherford scattering. Now, in this case, the proof was definitely not in the pudding because Thomson's pudding model was completely disproved by these results, and the model of the atom radically changed. However, Thomson wasn't quite out of the picture. By this point, he'd moved on from uh, cathode rays and was studying what were called canal, or really anode rays, that were positive ions that came from a positive electrode. And he'd used these to find that not all uh, atoms of a particular element had the same mass. Now, when you combine that with Rutherford's result, that you had this tiny nucleus, what it meant was that the nucleus of the same elements could have different masses. Now, using Bohr's model of the atom, people could study X-rays and they could predict the energy uh, uh, spikes that they'd expect to see in an X-ray spectrum when electrons very close to the nucleus were knocked out. And using that, they managed to establish that all nuclei of a particular element had the same electrical charge. So at this point, people knew that the elements all had a particular electrical charge, but that they had different masses of the nuclei. And what that meant was there had to be something else in the nucleus along with the proton. Now, initial thoughts were that maybe there was some strange subset of electrons that were tightly bound inside the nucleus, and so they sort of cancelled out the electric charge of the extra protons in there. However, that was very easily uh, disproved. And so the result was is that there had to be some sort of neutral particle that was included in the nucleus. And it took until 1932 before the neutron, as we now call it, was discovered. Now, the discovery of the neutron probably has to go down in history as the fastest ever discovery of a particle. In early 1932, a physicist, James Chadwick, became fascinated with proving the existence of the neutron. And it took him two weeks, just two weeks, working in a lab to publish his first paper in Nature on evidence for the existence of the neutron. Now what he did was he took a radioactive source of a material called polonium, and polonium is an alpha particle emitter. So this source would emit alpha particles. And what he did was he placed it next to a lump of beryllium. And the reaction that takes place is when alpha particles uh, hit the beryllium target, they are slowed down and eventually absorbed into one of the uh, nuclei of beryllium. And that causes the beryllium nucleus to change into a nucleus of carbon-12 and to boot out a neutron. 
So what he saw when he put these two together was that you were producing a stream of neutral um, radiation and that neutral radiation was not like gamma rays because when that radiation was uh, incident on a block of paraffin wax it kicked out protons from the paraffin wax and the protons of course were something because they're charged that are easy to detect and identify. And so with that evidence Chadwick came up with the first experimental data that confirmed the existence of the neutron inside the nucleus. So at this point we would got a relatively complete picture of the atom. We had protons and neutrons inside this densely packed nucleus that contained almost all the mass of the atom and surrounding them we had a cloud of electrons. However, there was one particle to this system that was important to discover and that is the particle that was responsible for holding the electrons around the positive nucleus and that was the photon. Now the photon is an interesting particle. Indeed, the first person to think that light might actually be made of particles was in fact Sir Isaac Newton who called these particles corpuscles which was also what J.J. Thomson wanted to call the electron. So thankfully neither of them got their way in terms of naming, otherwise I'd be known as a corpuscle physicist and that doesn't really have the same ring as particle physics. So that was the early, you know, the, the idea had been around since Isaac Newton studied light. However, in the 1800s uh, Young proved that light diffracted and so then everybody thought of light as a wave. And this changed around the turn of the century, uh, the early 20th century. And the first evidence came from black body radiation. Now, you can calculate black body radiation, as I'm sure most of you already know, by assuming, you know, considering you've got a cavity, and in that cavity you've got every possible standing wave of electromagnetic radiation. And the equipartition theory from thermodynamics says that every single one of those standing wave modes has exactly the same energy in it if your cavity is at thermodynamic equilibrium. The problem with that is as your wavelength shortens you get more and more nodes. And that means the energy in the cavity in shorter and shorter wavelengths increases because each mode in classical physics has exactly the same energy stored in it and you've got more and more modes and so you've got more and more energy. And in fact this produces a spectrum which is not just wrong, it's infinitely wrong. And so the Rayleigh gene spectrum that's calculated based on this, you know, goes, shoots off to infinity as the wavelength uh, reduces to zero. Now obviously that was wrong and the solution to that was devised by a guy named Planck and what he suggested was that well maybe the energy in each of these electromagnetic modes is quantized and so there was a Planck constant involved H and H times the frequency was the minimum energy that you could put into one of these modes. And when you recalculated the spectrum using that assumption, suddenly you got a black body spectrum that agreed with observation. And so that was the first evidence that, that, that light was not entirely just a classical wave. The next bit of evidence, of course, came from our old friend Einstein, who showed with the photoelectric effect that when light kicked out electrons from the surface of a metal, when that metal was in a vacuum, the energy of the electrons increased with the frequency of light and not with the intensity of light. And no matter how intense your light was, if the light was below a certain frequency for a particular metal, you didn't get any electrons out at all. And so that was clear evidence that the interaction that was going on between light and the electrons in the metal was a particle to particle interaction. However, the real clincher came in 1932 when the American physicist Arthur Compton showed that when X-rays scattered off a surface, the wavelength of the X-ray changed. And the only way that you could explain that 
would be by using relativistic kinematics to calculate the change in energy of a photon of light uh, scattering off an electron and you know depending on the angle that was scattered through in order to conserve the momentum and energy in relativity you had to have the scattered photon having less energy and that because of the relationship that Planck had established meant that it had to have a different wavelength or different frequency. And so at that point it was well established that light was made up of particles called photons. And that was sort of the end of the prehistory of particle physics. So by the end of 1932 we had a pretty good picture of how matter was arranged and how it all stuck together. We had the extremely dense nucleus established by Rutherford that was made up of protons and neutrons and surrounding it we had our cloud of electrons and the whole thing was bound together by photons and electrons would emit photons or absorb photons when they moved between energy levels uh, in the atom. However, there were a few just niggling little doubts and problems with this picture. The first was what was sticking all the protons together in the nucleus? We knew that a nucleus consisted, could consist of multiple protons and if you stick two protons, both with positive charges, uh, together at a distance of about 10 to the minus 14 meters, that's the size of a typical nucleus, you have an enormous electrostatic repulsion. Something was clearly overcoming that repulsion and sticking them together and it was also sticking together the neutral particles, the neutrons, were also getting bound. So it clearly wasn't an electrical force because it applied to neutral particles as well. What that was at 1932 was a complete mystery. The other problem that existed was uh, something called beta decay. Now beta decay by this point was well established. They knew that a, a nucleus could undergo radioactive decay, change into a different element as Rutherford had showed, and emit a high energy electron. The problem was is when you have beta decay you start with your parent nucleus and you decay into a daughter nucleus plus an electron. And you can sum together the masses of the daughter nucleus and the electron and subtract those from the mass of the parent nucleus and that mass difference gives you the energy that's released. But that means you've got a fixed amount of energy released every time there's a decay and you've got two decay products, the nucleus and the daughter nucleus and the electron. And there's only one way that you can apportion that energy between the two decay products such that both energy and momentum are conserved. And that means that every time a beta decay happened, you expected to see a single energy of electron produced. But when they studied the energies uh, that were produced in beta decay, they found the electron had a range of energies. And nobody had an explanation for that. Now, the solution to these two problems turned out to be that there were some missing particles from the model. Um, but before those particles were actually discovered, a, another physicist that we mentioned right back at the start, a guy named Dirac, came up with a radical new theory that completely doubled the number of particles overnight in an unexpected way. And so in the next video we'll discuss how, Dirac, uh, how Dirac's theory doubled the number of particles how we solve these two problems that we had with the existing model and we're going to add lots of new particles. In effect, we're going to open the gates to the particle zoo.